Hello everyone, welcome back to the Polytime channel. My name is Red and I'm back with another episode of Polytime Reads. This is the third episode where I'll be reading uh, the book by Yanis Varoufakis called Techno-Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism? And today I am reading the third chapter. Did I already say that? I don't, honestly don't remember. It's been a long day and I'm tired and hey, I'm only human and everybody experiences uh, short-term memory loss when they're tired. <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. Um, before we could do go any further, I would like to say that I'm glad and happy to see all the support on these last episodes of this series. I'm glad to see that we are, you know, being used as a resource uh, for uh, people to educate themselves on Marxist ideas, and that's really dope. That's pretty cool, and I'm very happy to, you know, to be able to serve that role. And of course. I also need to do a little bit of a shameless plug. Um, if you do enjoy this content and decide that you want to support us, you can do so over at Patreon. If you don't want to support us on Patreon or you can support us in monetary ways, check out our website to see how you can help us out in alternative ways. The link is in the description below if you want to check it out. However, if you do support us on Patreon. You can also join our public Discord server. Of course, everybody can join the Discord server, uh, where if you do both of those things, you get access to some special perks and you get access to the weekly Polytime podcast Q&A. Uh, you can submit your questions in the server and then on our podcast every week, we will try to, to answer your questions as best as we can. And of course, also make sure to support us uh, on our social media platforms so that you are up to date with all the new content coming out. Uh, you can you know interact with different stuff that we do, like asking you uh, how you are enjoying our content and how or what other type of content you would like for us to do with a series that we have called Polydyne Pulse Check and other stuff we do on there, which we don't really do anywhere else. So make sure to support us over there. And with that being said, we can now get into the book. So as I said, this is chapter three. Chapter three is called Cloud Capital. For those who watched the last episode, you will know that uh, this is where the actual content of the book starts or or the theory of techno feudalism starts of course the other chapters are very interesting the first one is a very sweet story about yanis and then the second one is a very good and a very interesting read about the development of capitalism and a very interesting view specifically when it comes to uh, the birth of neoliberalism and how that has a, had a great impact and also the you know the birth of uh, um, not directly the birth of the european union but the specifically the uh, the re the rebuilding of Europe after World War II, and it's something that's very interesting, and also something after reading that chapter, something which I myself w suddenly had a bit of a realization about the European Union, which I hadn't really had before, um, and so. You know, it was, a, it was a great read. And in fact, if you would like to see exactly what I mean by that uh, regarding the European Union, stay tuned to, uh, you know, in the following weeks of this episode, because I am planned to release uh, an article over at our website about it, about, uh, you know, the European Union. I've done one already before in the past, but this one is a bit of a revision or kind of a reevaluation of my position towards the European Union with this newfound information. So. Let's actually start reading. In Justice League, a Hollywood blockbuster that brought together a swath of superheroes in a bit to save Earth from desertification, there's a scene in which Aquaman gets into the car of Bruce Wayne, the man behind the legendary Batman. What's your superpower again? He asks with the interpretations of a superhero brat. I am rich, replies Wayne. Okay, I have to do a bit of a bit of a I have to insert myself here as a huge nerd of comic book uh, heroes and and movies uh, I have to inform you that uh, that it was not Aquaman who got into the the car uh, in fact it was uh, the flash or Barry Allen it, does that have any importance towards the book no but this is this is a huge mistake from uh, in my part this is a massive issue uh, no I'm just joking um anyways moving on the implication is both simple and profound. Serious power comes from serious wealth, not from Superman's alien muscles or Iron Man's st steely uh, exoskeleton. 
Nothing new there, you will remark. As I was saying, it's a rich man's world. But what precisely is it that turns riches, which riches into a superpower? At the most primitive level, it is a asymmetrical access to scarce resources. Imagine wandering lost in the Sahara Desert, on the verge of dying of thirst. I approach you on a camel, laden with flasks of water. Suddenly, I have the power to make you vol volunteer to do things on my behalf. Similarly, with Jill and Gail, two neighboring drought-hit farmers, when only Jill discovers a water source on her land, she immediately acquires power over Gail. Exclusive ownership of integrated fertile land is a classic source of power. More than 3,000 years ago, as you once explained, the Dorians swooped down from the north upon the Greek peninsula. Because they had iron weapons that the Messanians lacked, they took over the good land. Once they had it, they acquired power over those who had lost it. And until fairly recent, it was the precise combination of land and sophisticated weaponry that they decided who did what to whom, who had power and who had to obey. This was feudalism. Then something strange happened. Power decoupled from land and vested itself to a previously unparalleled degree in owners of something called capital instead. What's capital? It's not money, even though money can buy you capital, in the same way it can buy you land, gizmos, good publicity. And it's not weapons even, though weapons can help you expropriate capital as well as land. Before capitalism, capital was easy to define. It took the form of material goods that were produced specifically for the purpose of producing other goods. A steel sword, in this sense, was not capital since it could produce nothing except a severed head or a pierced torso. But a steel pouch or a fishing rod were typical capital goods, or to rephrase the definition, produced means of production. Capital goods mattered millennia before capitalism. Without the sophisticated tools of ancient engineers, no city like Babylon, temple like the, the Parthenon, or Fortification like China's Great Wall could have been erected. From the fictional Robinson Crusoe, who survived his ordeal because of the fishing rods, guns, hammers, and chisels that he salvaged from his shipwreck, to the great feudal estates that funded Europe's splendid cathedrals, capital goods, armed the human hand with new powers, stirred our imagination and enhanced our productivity, not to mention our ca capacity to kill each other with very greater efficiency. But then came capitalism, riding on capital's brand new capacity, the power to command. Oh, is this, yep, never mind, okay, there you go. Sometimes I have trouble recognizing if I skipped one page or two at the same time. In 1829, a 38-year-old Englishman decided to quit England and seek his fortune in Australia. Thomas Peel, a man of means and political connections, sailed to the Antipas with three good ships carrying, besides his family, 350 workers, men, women, and children, seeds, tools, and other capital goods, plus 50,000 pounds in cash, a considerable sum back then, roughly equivalent to, damn, 4.6 million of today's pounds. And the idea was to set up a small but modern agriculture colony on the 1,000 square kilometers of land and colonial authorities had expropriated from the natives on, this, on his behalf. But soon after arriving, his plans were in ruins. The main cause of Peel's failure was unimaginable to him. His plans were meticulous. Yes, there would be hardships from bad crops and resistance from native Australians to tussles with the local colonial authorities. However, with his political cult, skilled English workers, top-notch imported capital goods, and with enough money to pay the workers and buy the necessary raw materials for a long while, he thought he had everything in hand. Alas, as Karl Marx quipped decades later, there was one thing Peel had failed to bring to England. 
capitalism. Yeah, from yeah, from England. Capitalism. Sorry, I don't remember if I read to or from, but yeah, from England. It was capitalism that he failed. Peel's undoing came when something unexpected happened. His workers abandoned him in masses. An antipodian 19th century version of the Great Resignation. They simply moved on, got themselves plots of land in the surrounding area, and went into businesses for themselves. It was a disaster Peel was ill-prepared for by his English background. Lulled into a false sense of control by the situation in the English Isles, the British Isles, he assumed that the capital he had brought along from Mother England vested him all the power he needed over his English employees. Peel's assumption was that his workers had no option other than wage labor. It was a sound assumption in Britain where, following the enclosures, the mass privatization of common land that took place from the end of the 18th century onwards expelled peasants lacked access to the, any land. Landless laborers resign a wage job in Manchester, Liverpool, or Glasgow would simply starve to death. In Western Australia, however, the plentiful land and even allowing for the pre presence of Australians' indigenous inhabitants offered them an alternative, resignation and self-employment. And so, hapless Mr. Peel was left with splendid, made-in-English capital goods, money, in hand, but no power to command his workers. Land is what it is, the fertile soil on which vegetables grow, animals graze, buildings are erected, and on which humans must stand before we run, sail or reach for the skies and stars. But capital, much like labor, is different from land in that it has a second nature. Th something I began to realize once you introduced me to light's particular dual nature. Sure enough, one of capital's natures is tangible, physical, and measurably productivity enhancing. But its second nature is an ineffable power to command others, a potent but fragile power that Peel misunderstood to his great detriment. The transition from feudalism to capitalism was, in essence, a shift of the power to command from landowners to owners of capital good. For that to happen, peasants had first to lose autonomous access to, com to common land. That's why the enclosures in Britain were essential for capitalism's birth. They denied British labor the opportunities Peel's workers discovered in Western Australia. I remember you telling me that every year workers at Chalivorjiki, the Greek steel plant where you worked all your life, would take a month's leave without pay, sometimes longer, to return to their villages to pick their olives or harvest their wheat. Such options, you commented, are good for workers but not good for capitalism. By restricting access to land, the enclosures helped capital to transcend its original productivity enhancing role and to grow exponentially in commanding power. Before long, the worldwide commodification of previously common lands had enough capital to achieve supremacy in all corners of the globe. With the magnification of capital's commanding power over labor, capital's owner, owners amassed great wealth. As their wealth accumulated, their social power proliferated. They graduated from being employers to agenda setters wherever big decisions were being made. Soon capitalists could boss everyone around, including the landed gentry, even the royals. Indeed, the only way the aristocracy managed to hang on in some countries was by joining the capitalist class or at least deferring it to it. Capital's commanding power, its hidden force, reshaped the world from its genesis to some 200 years ago to the erection of the post-war technostructure to the global minotaur's rise and eventual fall in 2008. Today, however, we are witnessing the rise of a new form of capital with a capacity to command so unprecedented that it behoves us to rethink entirely the system to which it gave its name. I call it cloud capital. Back in the day, you brought home your friends for us to experiment with our fireplace by baptism of fire in the red heat of metallurgy. 
A couple of years ago, I too brought home two friends to experiment with, a Google Assistant and an Amazon Alexa. After two months of mostly ignoring the Google Assistant sitting on my desk, I had an intriguing conversation with it just before writing this, these lines. The conversation began by chance when it activated itself without my say-so. When on earth are you doing? I asked. I am learning new ways to help you better, responded the device in an agreeable female voice. Stop it immediately, I demanded. Sorry, I am, I, I am switching off, it said. Of course, that was a lie. These devices never sh s switch themselves off. They only pretend to be asleep. S still somewhat annoyed, I decided to inst instead of unplugging it, I would pit it against its competitor. Okay, Google, what do you think of Alexa? I inquired. I like her, especially her blue light, it answered unflappably before adding, we assistants must stick together. From the room next door where Amazon's device was sitting on the other desk, Alexa activated itself to utter one word, thanks. This eerie show of solidarity between com competing AI devices concentrated my mind on the pressing question we often forget to ask. What exactly is a device like Alexa? What does it actually do? If you ask Alexa, it will tell you it is a home-based virtual assistant technology ready to accept your command, to switch on its lights, order more milk, take down a note, call a friend, search the internet, tell a joke, to be, in short, your dedicated, eager mechanical servant. All true, except that Alexa will never, ever tell you what it truly is a tiny cog in a vast cloud-based network of power within which you are a mere node a speck of digital dust dust at best a plaything of forces beyond your comprehension or control don draper also treated us condescendingly he sold us the sizzle not the steak he weaponized our nostalgia and manipulated our melancholy, melancholia sorry, to sell us chocolate bars, fatty burgers, and slide projectors. He worked out how to make us buy things we didn't need or want really. He bought our attention to commodify our souls and pollute our bodies. But with Don, at least we, may, we had a fighting chance. It was with his wits against ours. With Alexa, we stand no chance. Its power to command is systemic, overwhelming, galactic. As we chat on the phone or move and do, th do things about the house, Alexa listens, observes, and learns our pre preferences and habits. As it gets to know us, it develops an uncanny capacity to surprise us with good recommendations and intriguing ideas. Before we realize it, the system hiding behind Alexa has acquired a substantial power to curate our reality in order to guide our choices, effectively to command us. How is this different to what Don Draper, to, to what Draper did? Hugely is the answer. Don had a talent to invent ways to instill manufactured desires in us, but it was a one-way street. Through the medium of television or large billboards in cities and along highways, Don would implant longing into our subconscious. That was that. However, with cloud-based Alexa-like devices in Don's place, we find ourselves in a permanently active two-way street between our soul and the cloud-based system hiding behind Alexa's soothing voice. In the words of the philosophers, Alexa, Alexa, sorry, ensnares us in the most dialectic of infinite regress. Which means what exactly? It means that we begin, that what begins with us training Alexa to do things on our behalf soon spins out of control into something that we can neither fathom nor regulate. For once we have trained its algorithm and fed it data on our habits and desires, Alexa starts training us. How does it do this? It begins with soft nudges to provide it with more information about our whims, with which it then tailors into access to videos, text, and music that we appreciate. Once it has won us over in this matter, we become more su suggestible to its guidance.
In other words, Lexa trains us to train it better. The next step is, is spookier. <laughs> Having impressed us with its capacity to appeal to our tastes, it proceeds to curate them. This it does by exposing us to images, text, and videos, ex video experiences that it selects in order to subtly to condition our whims. Before long, it is training us to train it, to train us, to train it, to train us ad infinitum. This infinite loop or regress allows Alexa and the great algorithm, algorithmic network hiding in the cloud behind it to guide our behavior in ways superbly lucrative for its owners. Having automated Alexa's power to manufacture or at least curate our desires, it grants its owners a, grants its owners a magic wand with which to modify our behavior, a power that every marketeer has dreamed of since the time immemorial. This is the essence of algorithmic cloud-based command capital. Humanity's ancient fear of its technological creations is at the heart of many of Hollywood's future favorite storylines. Movies like The Terminator and The Matrix turn on the same fear that animated Meryl Streep's Frankenstein and Hesoid's ancient telling of the tale of Pandora in which she is a robot made by Hephaestus on Zeus's instructions to punish us for Prometheus's crimes of stealing fire from the gods on our behalf. All such tales, movies, and TV series featured a so-called singularity, the moment a machine or a network of machines achieves consciousness. At that point, it generally takes one, uh, one long look at us, its creators, and decides we're not fit for its purpose before proceeding to eradicate, enslave, or mere, uh, merely make us miserable. The problem with this storyline is that by emphasizing a non-existent threat, it leaves us exposed to a very real danger. Machines like Alexa or impressive AI chatbots like whoa, AI chatbots like ChatGPT are nowhere near the feared singularity. They can't pretend to be sentient, but are not, and arguably can never be. But even if they are themselves stupider than a wet tea towel, their effects can be devastating, their power over us exorbitant. After all, today for relatively modest sums, one can buy killing machines programmed by face recognition and self-teaching capabilities that render themselves effectively autonomous by contrast with, say, drones that must be remotely piloted by humans. If these can fly autonomously through a building, choosing whom to kill and whom to spare, who cares that they are not sentient? Similarly, with Alexa and other such devices, it matters not on IOTA that they are mindless appendages of a data-crushing network that only stimulates intelligence nor that their creators might have been motivated by curiosity and profit-seeking rather than some fiendish plan to subjugate humanity. What matters is that they exercise unimaginable power over what we do on behalf of a tiny band of flesh and blood humans. This too might be thought of as a singularity, singularity, albeit in a slightly simpler sense. The moment when something is invented by us becomes independent of and more powerful than us, subjugating us to its control. Indeed, from the original Industrial Revolution to this day, we have endowed machines with a life of their own, whether steam engines, search engines, or apps are glorious artifacts, may be totally dumb, but they can be they can make us feel, in Marx's words, like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. The other thing this storyline omits is that singular singularities do not come about thanks to techno technology alone. Something social and political needs to make take place first. In a previous book, which I addressed to your granddaughter, I speculated about what would have happened had James Watt invented the stream steam engine in ancient Egypt. 
the most he could have expected is that the ruler of Egypt would have been impressed and placed one or more of his engines in his place, demonstrating to visitors and underlying how ingenious his empire was. My point was that the reason the steam engine changed the world rather than ending up a snow piece in some ruler's landscape or garden was the epic raid on the common lands that had preceded its invention, the enclosures. The singularity now called the Great Transformation, the name given by the great theorist Karl Polanyi to the birth of the market society over the course of the 20th, the, sorry, the 19th and the early 20th centuries involved, involved pre precisely this sequence. First, the plunder of the common lands, made possible by prude state violence, and only then watched splendid technological breakthroughs. A, stri a strikingly similar sequence gave birth to cloud capital. First, the epic ransacking of the internet commons, made, made possible by pol politicians, and then a sequence of spectacular technological in in inventions, sorry, from Sergey Burns' search engine to the dazzling array of today's AI applications. In short, in the last two and a half centuries, humans, humanity has had to reckon with two singularities, either of which required machines to attain sentience. Rather, each required a comprehensive plunder of a commons, a co complicit political class, and only then a marvelous technological breakthrough. That's how, a, the, uh, that's how the original age of capital transpired, and that's how the age of cloud capital is now dawning. Telling the full story of how this happened will help explain how cloud capital gained its unprecedented power. Now that computers speak to each other, will this network make capitalism impossible to overthrow? Or might it finally reveal its Achilles heel? To gauge the internet's impact on capitalism, we need to first understand its evolving relationship, relationship sorry, with capitalism. At the beginning, it had none. The early internet was a capitalism-free zone. If anything, it seemed like an homage to Soviet Gosplan. The state planning com committee whose job was to replace the market machine machinism. A centrally designed, state-owned, non-commercial network. At the first time, it featured elements of early liberalism, even tributes to what I call anarcho-syndicalism a network without hierarchy. It relied on horizontal decision-making and manual gifts, gift exchange, not market, market exchange. What is unimaginable today made perfect sense at the time. America was transitioning from its war economy to the, real, to the realities of Cold War. Even the most ardent free market, marketeers understood that planning for a nuclear confrontation with the Soviet Union was too important to be left to market forces. As the nuclear arms race gathered place, the Pentagon chose centrally to finance the design and construction of a network of decentralized computers. It's a single purpose, to work out how to make different silos housing nuclear weapons communicate with each other, and all of them with Washington, without a central hub that the Soviet nuclear bomb could take out in, a one, in one go. That's how history's greatest ever antimony came about. A US government built and owned non-commercial computer network that lay outside capitalist markets and imperatives, but whose purpose was the defense of the capitalist realm. But as we know from the previous chapter, the early internet was no aberration. Its uncommodified nature chimped with what was going on in the broader US economy, which was dominated by a technostructure that was scorned free markets and unsurped them for its own purpose. And in Japan, which was being rebuilt under US supervision along these same lines. In this global environment, it was a no great wonder that the most promising nascent technology, the fledging internet, was also built as a digital commons. Rather than relying on what was effectively a non-existent market, 
cooperation throughout the West and including Japan was the obvious way to build a digital network to the Pentagon th that the Pentagon needed. Eager to enlist the brightest computer geeks from across various countries, it also made sense to design the internet in such a way that maximized unencumbered communication between the techno structures experts. A protocol is a language by which computers can communicate numbers and text, including the addresses of senders and receivers. Those building the original internet decided on common or open protocols, protocols, languages that were available for anyone to use for free. Internet One, the original internet, was thus invented and maintained by military scientists, academics, and researchers who were employed by a variety of non-commercial bodies across the United States and its Western allies. Thanks to its accessibility and spirit of shared endeavor, it attracted countless enthusiasts who, who produced much of its foundation for free, S f some for love, others out of an insatiable urge to be among the prisoners, the pioneers, sorry, who built the world's first horizontal global non-intermediate communication network. By the 1970s, in Amer as America's global plan was dying and the global minotaur was being born, all the building blocks of the marvelous digital common were in place, and they still are, albeit hidden now under the monstrous edifices erected upon them by big tech. In fact, the remnants of Internet One still serve as well. Even though they function out of sight, Deep within our computers, we can't avoid occasionally catching glimpses of their acronyms. Letters like TCP, IP, which refer, refer to a protocol our computers send to or receive information, or POP, IMAP, and SMPT, the original protocols that still allow us to email each other, or perhaps the most visible of them all, HTTP, the protocol by which we visit websites. We pay not one penny to use these protocols, nor do we suffer advertisements as the indirect, indirect price for using them. Like Britain's common lands before the enclosures, they remain free for anyone to use. Not unlike Wikipedia, one of the few surviving examples of a commons-based service that makes huge quantities of work to produce and maintain but which no owner monetizes. Internet One was an unlucky child. Like a newborn whose mother died during its birth, its open protocols were formulated during a decade, the 1970s, that was inimical to such socialistic enterprises, even as they first batched data files, email pre predecessors, raced along internet one's original cables, the demolition of the global plan was already underway. And so, a shared network designed to be free from market forces was forced to take its first halting steps in the merciless new world of the Minotaur, where the banks had been liberated from many of the New Deal era shackles and the financialization of everything had begun. It is in the nature of financiers to gamble with the money clients ask them to proceed on their behalf, even if they only get to handle it for a few minutes. That's how they turn a profit. Their only constraints are the alertness of their clients and the occasional snooping of a financial regulator. That's why complexity is the financier's friend, for it allows them to discuss cynical gambles as smart financial products. Is it any wonder, then, that from the start financiers loved computers? As described in the previous chapter, from the late 1970s onwards, bankers shrouded their depth fueled bets in layers of computer-generated complexity that made the gargantuan risks visible and their own profits correspondingly vast. By the early 1980s, the financial derivatives on uh, on offer were built on algorithms so complex that even their creators stood zero chance of fully comprehending them. And so it was that, decoupled from the mundane world of physical capital, legitimized by the ideological, uh, the ideology, sorry, of neoliberalism, fueled by a new virtue called greed, shrouded in the complexity of their computers, financiers reinvented themselves, not without some justification, as masters of the universe. 
in that universe where algorithms had already become the financiers had made in the original commons like internet stood no chance new enclosures were only a matter of time as with the original enclosures some form of fence would be necessary to keep the masses out of such an important resource in the 18th century it was a land that the many were denied access to in the 21st century it was uh, was to our own identity think about it i still have the light blue id card that you were issued when you came out of the prison camp in 1950 i remember you telling me how the p police toyed with you before handling it to you handling it over it was an extreme example of how until fairly recently our relationship with our identity was meditated and controlled by the state which held a monopoly on the power tokens that legitimized us as rights holding citizens passports s birth certificates our faded id cards Today, these have been sidelined by a digital identity that in reality does more work every day than those material artifacts. And yet, astoundingly, our digital identities belong neither to us nor the state. Strewn across countless privately owned digital realms, it, it, it has many owners, none of whom in us, no, none of uh, whom is us, sorry. A private bank owns our ID codes and your entire purchasing record. Facebook is intimately familiar with whom and what you like. Twitter remembers every little thought that, you, that caught your attention, every option that you agreed with that made you furious, that you lingered over idly before scrolling on. Apple and Google know better than you do what you watch, read, buy, whom you meet, when and where. Spotify owns a record of your musical preferences more complex than the one stored in your conscious memory. And behind them all are countless other invisible gathering, monitoring, sifting, and trading your activity from information about you. With every day that passes, some cloud-based corporation whose owners you will never care to know owns another aspect of your identity. I remember the few years after television came to Greece when you and mom resisted by appeals to buy an idiot box, fearing it would take over our scene, senses and dull our evening discussions. Today resisting the corporation's illegal proliferation of our digital identities is much harder. One can of course insist on using cash only on buying stuff exclusively from bricks and mortar shops, and on using landlines or at most old fashioned flip phones that do not connect to the internet. But if one has kids, this means depriving them of a world of knowledge and fun that, will, that all other kids have access to. Moreover, as banks branch, post offices and local shops close down, our friends no longer post physical letters, and states place limits on how much cash you can use in a single transaction, resistance is becoming futile, except for people ready to turn into modern day hermits. For many, life under constant surveillance is intolerable. They rebel at the thought that big tech knows us better than anyone should. I sympathize, but to be honest, I am less worried about what they know and far, far more worried about what they own. To do anything in what used to be our digital commons, we must now plead with the big tech and big finance for the ability to use some of the data about us that they own outright. To wire money to a friend, to sub subscribe to a New York Times, or to buy socks for your granny using a debit card. You now have the option, you have no option but to give something of yourself in return. Perhaps a small fee, perhaps not, but always a piece of information about your preferences, sometimes a bit of your attention, usually your consent to be monitored, but to monitor further and ultimately brainwashed by some big fintech conglomerate that will help you verify it to you itself or to some similar outfit that you are who you are. It did not take, have to be this way. When the US Pentagon chose to make GPS available to everyone, 
to turn it over to the digital commons. They granted each of us the right to know our location in real time for free. No questions asked. It was a political decision to do so, as was the sinister decision that you and I should not have any means of establishing or provide our online identity. Another political decision by the US government, except this time clearly aimed at boosting big tech's power over us. How different would the internet be without these new enclosures? Imagine you could do what you could do if you owned your digital identity and could prove who you are, uh, who you are without relying on the combination of a bank card and a corporation like Uber or Lyft that possesses the card and all your subsequent travel data. In the same way, GPS pinpoints where you precisely are you would have the opportunity to broadcast over the internet. My name is George. I am on the corner of Aristotle and Plato Street, and I am heading to the airport. Anyone wishing to bid for my ride? Within seconds, you would receive a multitude of offers from people or outfits, including the license, sorry, to carry passengers, including sage advice from the municipal transit authority like why not take the metro located three minutes walk from where you are and much faster than any car can meander its way through traffic alas you can't do this in the world of internet 2 shaped by the new by the new enclosures you are routinely forced to hand over identity to a part of the digital realm that has been that has been fenced off such as uber or lyft or some other private company when you request a ride to the airport, their algorithm dispatches a driver for its choice of its choice with a view uh, to maximize the exchange value the company owning the algorithm extracts both from you and the driver. These new enclosures enable the plunder of the digital commons, which drove the incredible rise of cloud capital. I remember once hearing you explain why you admire the ancient ironsmiths because they had no concept of the Iron Age they were ushering in. Instead, they were driven by something within them, an impulse to experiment until they had freed steel from lumps of pig iron, like Michelangelo liberated his David from a block of marble. The technologists who recently ushered in the age of cloud capital were no different. Driven also by curiosity and an almost moral enthusiasm, they experimented with various technologies whose purpose was to liberate useful information from the grounding megalith of data that the internet's, at the internet's heart. To guide us to websites, friends, colleagues, books, films, and music that we might like, they wrote algorithms capable of categorizing us in clusters of internet users with similar search, pa search patterns and preferences. Then all of a sudden came the breakthrough, the real singularity. Their algorithms ceased to be passive. They began to behave in a way hitherto associated exclusively with persons. They turned into agents. This miracle took three leaps to con complete. The first was from simple algorithms to ones that could adapt their objectives in light of the outcome of their activity. In other words, to reprogram themselves. Machine learning was the technical term. The second leap replaced the standard computer hardware with exotic neural networks. The third and decisive leap infused neural networks with algorithms capable, capable of reinforcement learning. Emulating how you patent, patiently introduced me first to tin, then to bronze, and finally to iron and steel, allow, allow to introduce you to these three leaps at, one at a time. The early algorithms resembled recipes, mundane sets of step-by-step -step instructions to produce a pre-specified outcome, example, a lasagna. Later on, algorithms were released from the obligations to reach one pre-specified pre outcome and were allowed to pick albeit in a 
pre-programmed manner from a menu of possible outcomes that one must one best suited to unforeseen in, in eventualities akin to telling a cook that if the mince was gone off during the preparation a vegetarian lasagna outcome would replace the original meat based version that was leap one Meanwhile, computer hardware in which algorithms operate underwent a great transformation of its own. In order to process a lot more information faster, engineers, uh, uh, sorry, information faster, engineers developed a new design of hardware in crude imitation of the human brain, adopting layered net network structures that allowed for the interconnection of many different nodes, each containing useful information. This was the, la the second leap. But the key innovation that breathed something resembling agency with the algorithms was the third. Reinforcement learning was the child of software engineers who realized the algorithms had the potential to evaluate their own performance and make improvements far faster than any human could. To achieve this, they wrote into the, them two types of subprograms or subroutines. One that measures the algorithm's performance while it is in action and at tremendous speeds, and another called a reward function that helps the algorithm alter itself so as to improve its performance in accordance with the engineer's objectives. Using neural networks to pr process gargantuan amounts of data, algorithms featuring reinforcement learning could do things beyond Don Draper's imagination. By serving the reactions of millions of people to their pro prompts billions of times every hour, they could train themselves at lightning speeds, not only to influence us, but also to pull off the fascinating new trick that Alexa and her uh, ilk, as we saw earlier, are now capable of, to be influenced by the way they influence us, to affect themselves in, the, in light of the way they affect humans. How exactly they, they do so is entirely opaque. Even the people who write these algorithms do not understand it. Once the algorithm is in motion, the scale of the data involved and the speed at which it is processed would make it impossible for any human to trace its route through such a vast tree of proliferating decisions. Even they did have full access to a full record of its activity but left to their own devices, constantly monitoring and in insistently reacting to the outcomes of their own actions and then, to out and then the outcomes of their reactions, these algos, as they are known, have acquired some astonishing ca capacities that their own coders and programmers find hard to understand. There is n nothing new here, however, Remember how the financial engineers of the 1990s and 2000s used algorithms to create derivatives of such enormous complexity that they themselves had no idea of how uh, of knowing what was inside those de derivatives? Similarly to the engineers coding Alexa-like cloud-based services for the purpose of creating automated systems that modify our behavior, our building so much complexity into these systems that they don't really understand exactly why their systems do what they do. It is in our human nature to be vulnerable to anyone or anything that seems to understand us better than we do ourselves. In fact, we may have even more vulnerable to algorithms we know to be mindless than we are to real persons, because we are more easily looted into a false sense of security. We pretend Alexa is a person because we are not used to conversing with machines. The experience would otherwise be embarrassing or uncanny. But the fact that we know Alexa is not a person is how we come to terms with, the, with its intense no knowledge of us, which would otherwise be off-putting, creepy, or scary. At that precise moment when we relate to it as if it were a person, while we know it is not, we are at our most vulnerable, ready to fall into the trap of thinking of Alexa as a person, our own Pandora-like mechanical serfs. Alas, Alexa is no serf.
It is rather a piece of cloud-based command capital, which is turning you into a serf. With your aid and by means of your own unpaid labor, in our in order, sorry, to further enrich its owners. Every time we go online to enjoy the services of these algorithms, we have no option but to cut a Faustian deal with their owners. To use the personalized services their algorithms provide, we must submit to a business model based on the harvesting of our data, the tracking of our activity, the invisible curating of our consent. Once we have submitted to this, the algorithm goes into the business of selling things to us while selling our attention to others. At that point, something more profound kicks in, which gives the algorithm's owners immense power to predict our behaviors, to guide our preferences, to influence our decisions, to change our minds, to thereby reduce us to their unpaid servants, whose job is to provide our information, our attention, our identity, and above all patterns of behavior that train their algorithms. But is any of this really new? Is cloud capital radically different from any other kind of capital, such as hammers, steam engines, or the television networks that Don Draper deployed on to deployed sorry to manipulate our matrix of desires. It is certainly no less physical than these other kinds of capital. For the cloud metaphor is just that a metaphor. In reality, it is comprised of vast data warehouses containing endless rows of servers connected by a global globe spanning web of sensors and cables. Might cloud capital stand out because it, it is powered to command? That can't be it either. The story of Mr. Peel's misfortunes in Western Australia established that since capitalism's earliest day, all capital goods have commanding power, some a little more, others a little less. No, although cloud capital could command this in unprecedented ways, the key to grasping cloud capital's spe special nature, as we shall see in the way it reproduces itself and its power to command, a process that is very different to the one that reproduces hammers, steam engines, and television networks. Here is a glimpse of what makes cloud capital so fundamentally new, different and scary. Capital was hitherto been produced with some labor market within the factory, the office, the warehouse, aided by machines. It was wage workers who produced the stuff that was sold to generate profits with which in turn financed their wages and the production of more machines. That's how capital accumulated and reproduced. Cloud capital, in contrast, can reproduce itself in ways that involve no wage labor. How? By commanding almost the whole of humanity to chip into its reproduction for free. But first, let us make an important distinction between the effect of big tech on the traditional workplace where workers' conditions are more extreme, but not in essence any different from those of the mill workers of old, and its effect on the users of technological generally, which creates an essentially new condition altogether. By doing so, we shall see that while workers have become cloud pros, we all have become, become cloud serfs. The technology may be outlandishly new, but the way it is deployed to command badly paid workers on the factory floor is almost two centuries old. As they struggle to keep up with the computer devices that track and dictate the pace of their every move, Amazon warehouse workers would recognize themselves instantly in Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, 1936, one of, the favorite, one of your favorite movies forced to inspect and scan 1,800 Amazon packages an hour is an uncannily similar fate to, the, to that of Chaplin's character on the industrial factory line, who is trying to keep pace with a suddenly accelerating conveyor belt, and who is ultimately driven mad and falls into the vast machine whose cogs he could never truly become. 
When Juan Espinosa, a picker at a Staten Island Amazon warehouse, opened that Mr. Bezos couldn't do a full shift at that place as an undercover boss, anyone familiar with Fritz Lang's even earlier film, uh, Metropolis, in 1927, would have been reminded of the scene in which Freighter, the autocrat's son, inadvertently descends into his father's machine halls, where workers are engaged in a desperate struggle to keep the massive hands of huge clock-like machines aligned. Shocked at what he finds, Freighter holds his head in horror at the sight of machines marching the workers at an inhuman temple, mechanizing them ruthlessly. Some years ago, you asked if Big Tech's new gadgetry had significantly changed the traditional manufacturing process. No, I replied, at least not yet. As long as humans are still part of a semi-automated production line, performing tasks that the machines cannot, the pace of humans' workers will be dictated by machines whose priority is to squeeze the last drop of productive energy from their human co-workers. Does it matter, I imagine you asked, that in modern factories and warehouses, this control is no longer exercised by cogs, wheels, sporks, and belts, but by algorithms running on a plug-in device wirelessly connected to a company's neural network? No, not much. Could pro cloud pro, sorry, my term for wage workers driven to their physical limits by cloud-based algorithms suffer at work in ways that would be instantly recognized by whole generations of earlier proletarians. Take Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which the company describes as a crowdly, crowdsourcing marketplace that makes it easier for individuals and businesses to outsource their pro, 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 processes sorry, and jobs to a distributed workforce who can perform these tasks virtually. But let us call it what it is, a cloud-based sweatshop where workers are paid piece rates to work virtually. Nothing is, nothing is happening there that Karl Marx had not fully analyzed in the 20th century, in the 21st chapter, sorry, of the first volume of his capital, where he stated, peace wages become the most fruitful source of reduction in wages and of frauds committed by the capitalists. Precarious piecework, Marx added, is the most appropriate to the capitalist mode of production here, here. That's not to say that the algos have not cast a long shadow over the factory floor. They have. Algorithms have already replaced bosses in the transport, deliveries, and warehousing sectors. And workers forced to work for these algorithms find themselves in a modernist nightmare. Some non-corporal entity that not only lacks but is actually incapable of human empathy, allocates them work at a rate of its choosing before monitoring their response times. Released from any of the qualms even humane humans harbor, the algo bosses are at liberty to reduce the workers' paid hours, to increase their tempo to insanity-inducing levels, or to turn them, all out, turn them out onto the streets for inefficiency. At that point, the workers sacked by the algorithm are thrown into a Kafkaesque spiral and able to speak to a human capable of explaining why they were fired. Soon, no doubt, algorithms will develop union-busting capabilities too. As we speak, dazzling algorithms are mapping out the tens of thousands of molecules in key proteins in superbugs that threaten to kill or debilitate us. Once these proteins are fully decoded, the algorithms proceed, again without human input, to design exotic antibiotics that kill the superbug, a scientific triumph for the ages. What is there to stop a similar algorithm from designing a global supply chain that bypasses warehouses or factories in which trade unions seem likely to succeed in organizing workers? Trade unions could be snuffed out before they are even formed. So yes, cloud capital is turning workplaces into metropolis-like algo halls in which humans, human workers are reduced to exhausted cloud pros. And yet, 
Cloud pearls are not suffering a fate terrestrial pearls of the modern times variety would find surprising. Cloud capital, in short, continues to do in the world's factories, warehouses, and other traditional workplaces what wi that which traditional terrestrial capital always did, perhaps a little more efficiently. However, outside the traditional workplace, uh, places the traditional work places of work sorry cloud capital is demolishing everything we used to make we used to take for granted don draper is perhaps the romanticism's last poster boy he treated science with suspicion and computers with disdain he idealized nature and loved hitting the roads in his gargantuan cadillac he lived and breathed individualism he luxuriated in nostalgia he adored women until they fell for him, at which point he bolted. He feared emotions because he saw them as a, the ultimate repository of insights into the human spirit, and he used his talent to commodify this me mealage of memory, sentiment, fickleness, and insight so as to extract from customers monies they might have otherwise kept for themselves. His algorithmic double, Alexa, may be no romantic, but cloud capital monetizes our emotions more effectively than Don ever could. It tailor makes experiences that exploit our biases to drive consumption, and then it uses our responses to hone those experiences yet further. But that's only the beginning. Besides modifying our consumers, by our consumer behavior in ways Don Draper would marvel at and perhaps be appalled by, Cloud Capital was a far more impressive trick up its sleeve. It can command us to put work directly into its own production, reinforcement and maintenance. Consider what Cloud Capital consists of, smart software, server farms, cell towers, thousands of miles of optic, uh, of optic fiber. And yet, all of this would be worthless without content. The most valuable part of stock of cloud capital is not its physical component, but rather the stories posted on Facebook, the videos uploaded to TikTok and YouTube, the photos on Instagram, the jokes and insults on Twitter, the reviews on Amazon, or simply our movement through space, allowing our phones to alert Google Maps at the latest spot of, tra of traffic. In providing these stories, videos, photos, jokes, and movements, it is we who produce and reproduce, outside any market, the stock of cloud capital. This is unparalleled, unparalleled sorry. <laughs> Workers employed by General Electric, ExxonMobil, General Motors or any other major conglomerate collect in salaries and wages approximately 80% of the company's income. This proportion grows larger in smaller firms. By big tech's workers, in contrast, collect less than 1% of their firm's revenues. The reason is that paid labor performs only a fraction of the work that big tech relies on. Most of the work is performed by billions of people for free. Sure enough, most of us choose to do this, enjoy it even, broadcasting our opinions and sharing our lives' intimate details with our digital tribute and communities seem to satisfy some perverse express, expressive need of ours, no doubt. Under feudalism, feudalism, sorry, <laughs> serfs toiling away on their ancestral lands would have served great hardship, but still found it undesirable, if not unfathomable, to have their way of life taken away from them, their shared culture and traditions. Still, the harsh reality remained. At the end of the harvest, the landlord would send the serfs, the sheriffs, to extract the lion's share of their produce, of the produce, without paying the serfs a penny of it. So it goes without billions of us unwittingly producing cloud capital. The fact that we do so voluntarily, happily even, do not detract from the fact that we are unpaid manufacturers, cloud serfs, 
who daily self-directed toil enriches a tiny band of multi-billionaires residing mostly in California or Shanghai. This is the crux. The digital revolution may be turning wage workers into cloud pros who live increasingly precarious, stressful lives under the invisible thumb of algorithm bosses. And it may be replaced. It may have replaced Don Draper with extraordinary behavior modifi modification algorithms hidden behind elegant tabletop applicants like Alexa. But that's not the most significant fact about cloud capital. Cloud capital's singular achievement, a feat far superior to either of these, is the way it has revolutionized it own, its own reproduction. The true revolution cloud capital has inflicted on humanity is the conver conversion of billions of us into willing cloud serfs, volunteering to labor for nothing to reproduce cloud capital for the benefit of its owners. Enter Amazon.com and you have exited capitalism. Despite all the buying and the selling that goes on there, you have entered a realm which can't be thought of as a market, not even a digital one. I say this to people, which I frequently do in lectures and debates, they look at me as they would a madman. But once I start explaining what I mean, their fear for my sanity soon turns into fear for us all. Imagine the following scene straight out of a science fiction storybook. You are beamed into a town full of people, going about their business, trading in gadgets, clothes, shoes, books, songs, games, and movies. At first, everything looks normal. And then you begin to notice something odd. It turns out all, that all the shops, indeed every building, belongs to a chap called Jeff. He may not own the factories that produce the stuff sold in, in his shops, but he owns an algorithm that takes a cut of each sale and he gets to decide what, he, what can be sold and what cannot. If that were all, the scene would evoke an old western in which a lonesome cowboy rides into a town of, uh, to discover what a podgy strongman owns the salon, the s grocery store, the post office, the railway, the bank, and naturally, the sheriff. Except that isn't it. Jeff owns more than the shops and the public buildings. He also owns the dirt you walk on the bench you sit on, even the air you breathe. In fact, in these weird town, everything you see and don't see is regulated by Jeff's algorithm. You and I may be walking next to each other, our eyes trained in the same direction, but the view provided to us by the algorithm is entirely bespoke, carefully curated according to Jeff's properties. Everyone navigating their way around Amazon.com, except Jeff, is wandering in algorithmical, constructed isolation. This is no market town. It is not even some form of hyper-capitalist digital market. Even the ugliest of markets are meeting places where people can interact and exchange information reasonably freely. In fact, it is even worse than a totally monopolized market. There, at least the buyers can talk to each other, form associations, perhaps organize a consumer boycott to force the monopolist to reduce a price or to provide a quality. Not so in Jeff's realm, where everything and everyone is intermediated, not by the disinterested, invisible hand of the market, but by an algorithm that works for Jeff's bottom line and dances exclusively to his tune. If this is not scary enough, recall that it is the same algorithm which via Alexa has trained us to train it to manufacture our desires. The mind rebels at the enormity of the hubris. The same algorithm that we help train in real time to know us inside out both modifies our preferences and administrates the selection and delivery of commodities that will satisfy these preferences. It is as if Don Draper could not only implant us desires for specific products, but, add, but had attained the superpower instantly to deliver said products to our doorstep, 
bypassing any potential competitor and all in the interest of bolstering the wealth and power of a chap called Jeff. Such concentrated power should scare the living daylight out of the liberally minded. Anyone committed to the idea of the market, not to mention the autonomous self, should recognize that cloud capital is its death knell. It should also shake market skeptics, socialists in particular, out of the compla complacent assumption that Amazon.com is bad because it is a capitalist market gone berserk. Actually, it is something worse than that. If it ain't a capitalist market, what in the sweet Lord's name are we stepping into when we enter Amazon.com? A student at the University of Texas asked me a few years ago. A type of digital thief, I replied instinctively. A post-capitalist one, whose historical roots remain in feudal Europe, but whose integrity is maintained today by a futuristic dystopian type of cloud-based capital. Since then, I have, become, I have come to believe that it was a reasonable, accurate answer to a, to a hard question. Under feudalism, the overlord would grant so-called thieves to subordinates called vassals. These thieves gave the vassals the formal right to exploit economically a part of, of the overlord's realm, to plant crops on it, for example, or graze cattle in exchange for a portion of the produce. The overworld the overlord, sorry, would then unleash his sheriff to police the thief's exec execution and collect what he was owned. Jeff's relationship with the vendors on Amazon.com is not too dissimilar. He grants them cloud-based digital thieves for a fee and then leaves his algo chief to achieve sheriff, sorry, as algo sheriff to police and collect. Amazon was just the start. Alibaba applied the same techniques to create a similar cloud thief in China. Copycat e-commerce platforms offering variations on the Amazon theme are springing up, are springing up everywhere in the global south as, a, as well as the global north. More significantly, other, other industrial sectors are turning into cloud thieves too. Take for example Tesla, Elon Musk's successful electric car company. One reason financiers value it so much higher than Ford or Toyota is that its cars, every circuit is wired into cloud capital. Besides giving Tesla the power to switch off one of its cars remotely, if, for instance, the driver fails to service it as the company wishes, merely by driving around Tesla owners are uploading in real-time information, including what music they are listening to, that enriches the company's cloud capital. They may not think of themselves as cloud servers, but alas, that's precisely what the proud owners of new, wonderfully, aerodynamically gleaming Teslas are. It took a mind-bending scientific breakthroughs, fantastically sounding neural networks and imagination-defying AI programs to accomplish what? To turn workers toiling in warehouses, driving cabs and delivering food into cloud proles? To create a world where markets are increasingly replaced by cloud thieves? To force businesses into the role of vassals? and to turn all of us into cloud servers glued to our smartphones and tablets, eagerly producing the cloud capital that keeps our new lord overlords on cloud nine. If I had to name one thing I learned from you, it would be the ability to rel relish contradictions. You worshipped iron, but were moved to tears by Hesoid's tirades against the Iron Age. You threw your lot in with the communists, knowing full well that if your side won, you would end up in the gulag. You fell in love with the, with the very furnace, pipe, conveyor belt, and crane in the steel factory where you worked, but remained horrified by the tendency to mechanize, alienate, and dehumanize the workers appended to them. 
It is why I wanted to talk to you about Cloud Capital, because you would know how to admire and attest it at once. And because through this contradiction, you would recognize that Cloud Capital is the key to answering your question about the Internet's impact on capitalism. At capitalism surface surface story when owners of capital goods steam engines machine tools spinning genies telegraph poles etc acquire the power to command people and nation and nations powers that far exceeded for the first time those of landlords the landowners sorry it was a great transformation made possible by that prior privatization of common lands same with cloud capital to acquire its even greater power to command, it required the prior, prior, prior privatization of other crucial commons. Internet won. Like all capital since capitalism inception, cloud capital can be thought of as a vast production and behavior modification machine. It produces marvelous devices and the power for its owners to command humans who do not own it. But that's where the similarities between terrestrial and cloud capital ends, and where the difference between conventional capitalists and cloudists begin. Previously to exercise capital's power to command and make other humans work faster and consume more, capitalists required two types of professionals, managers and market, marketeers. Especially under the auspice of the post-war technostructure, these two services Professions achieved greater prominence even than bankers and insurance brokers. Gleaming new businesses schools were set up to initiate MBA students in the dark arts of quick marching a workforce towards exploitive labor productivity. Advertising and marketing departments nurtured, nurtured a generation of Don Drapers. Then Cloud Capital arrived. At one in one fell swoop, it automated both roles. The exercise of capital's power to command workers and consumers alike was handed over to the algos. This was a far more revolutionary step than replacing auto, auto workers with industrial robots. After all, industrial robots do simply what automation has been doing since before the Luddites, making proletarians re redundant or more miserable, or both. No, the truly historic disruption was to automate capital's power to command people outside the factory, the shop or the office, to turn all of us, cloud proles, and everyone else into cloud serfs, into the direct unremunerated service of cloud capital, unmediated by any market. Meanwhile, conventional capitalist manufacturers increasingly have no option but to sell their goods at the discretion of the cloudalists, paying them a fee for the privilege of developing a relationship with them no different than that of vassals vis a vis their feudal lords. So back to your question. Now that computers speak to each other, will this network make capitalism impossible to overthrow? Or might it finally reveal its Achilles heel? On one hand, the rise of cloud capital has solidified the augmented and massively expanded capital's triumph over labor, society, and catastrophically, catastroph catastrophically sorry, nature. And yet, here is the contradiction. In doing so, cloud capital has simultaneously ushered in the techno-feudal system that has kill killed capitalism in so many realms and is in the process of replacing it in every el everywhere else. In your youth, you dreamed of a time where labor would shake off the yoke of the capitalist market. So did I. At last, something more like the opposite happened. It is the capital that has shaken off the yoke of the capitalist market. And while capital is taking its victory lap, capitalism itself is receding. A sophism to the sweeten the pill of our defeat not so, as I intend to show in chapter 5. For now, however, let us address perhaps the most surprising and compelling aspect of capitalism's demise. The story of how the cloudalists pulled off the astonishing feat and how, for them, profit once 
the driving force for our capitalist economy became optional. And with that, we have reached the end of chapter three. That was a very interesting chapter. Um, prior to having this book, I have watched many interviews uh, from Giannis uh, talking about this book and essentially explaining uh, what tech, techno feudalism is. Um, and maybe it was the extra context that, of course, the book adds, which allowed me to find that it allowed it to finally click in my head and made me go, oh, I get it. And I hate it. <laughs> I hate it more than ever. Um, this chapter has truly allowed me to to understand what he means, you know, what a cloud surface, what a cloud, what a cloud prole is, what he means with the thieves, with the thieves. You know, at the fiefdoms that you know the ca the cloudalists have you know give to the the other corporations you know to the to the to the what were once the capitalists what are now simply vessels in the techno feudalist system it's very interesting to now better understand what he means and i'm and we're only like what like one third of the way of the book maybe a little over that so I'm very curious to see what else there's in store for, you know, for this series. Um, and that was a very interesting chapter. Um, I don't even really know what to say. I think that it did a pretty good job at explaining what it wanted to explain. And I don't really know what to comment on it. I just am very surprised and also very interested in it. And I think that I need to be able to fully process what I've just read to be able to comment on it. Um, and so that won't be today, I guess. Of course, like the previous series where we read the Communist Manifesto, at the end of the series, I'm going to record an episode, you know, only dedicated and, you know, just single, like just dedicated to kind of summarizing and, and being able to create some sort of conclusion or a personal conclusion to the book. Um, so there, I guess I can ha I can give you a better commentary on what exactly this meant, uh, and on what exactly this means. So yeah, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you did, make sure to support us over on Patreon. If you can support us on a on Patreon but still want to support us, check out our website. The script the link is on the script in the description below. Uh, on so you can check out how you can help us in alternative ways. If you want, you can also join our public Discord server. And if you do that and also support us on Patreon, you can also submit questions to our podcast Q&A that we do every week. And our, our, our Q&A that we do on our podcast every week. That's what I meant to say, sorry. Uh, and of course check out our social media platforms it feels kind of weird saying that after what i just read you know telling you to check out our social media platforms it does make you feel like a bit of a hypocrite in a way and that's kind of awful but it's kind of what Giannis said uh you can you know you can try to not you know be on social media and do that but are you going to become a modern day hermit you know and just be completely closed off of of society it's very hard it's like a weird pressure that's upon you and everybody you know that's that's complicated but with that message uh i will see you all in the next episode goodbye everybody